Sadistic Penguin Studios presents the At The Show Podcast with Tom Yumper Garcia. Okay, you people sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. And Tony Tulsa Burt. I don't know this industry jargon, YP, MP, whatever, okay? All I know is that I cannot get a record contract. We cannot get a record contract unless I take these tapes. It's almost time, so grab a drink. Get your popcorn ready and join the film discussion with two guys from Chicago talking movies. Ooh, we got our favorite little gif up there, Tony. Welcome, everyone, to episode 36 of season four of the At The Show podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Tom Yumper garcia and I'm with my other co-host, Tony the Sugar Baggy Bird. How you doing, my guy? I'm doing good. Glad to be here. Everyone out there, we're in November. Let's give thanks for you guys being here and listening to us talking great movies. Yes, sir. We are going to talk some good movies today. We're going to do our Halloween leftovers today for... Uh, you know, since Halloween, it was yesterday. It is it is November first, so it's still Halloween in my book this week. It's it's a day later, and even today at work, I still continued Halloween festivities because to me, even this weekend tomorrow, going to another pumpkin patch. There's still a couple still open, and I take every last minute to take it all in. <laughs> I haven't gone to a pumpkin patch this year, but uh, went to a couple parties. <clears throat> also the trunk or treat i know you've done the trunk or treat as well yes those are always awesome even yesterday just doing regular trick-or-treating the wind was real heavy but uh got some really good good stuff not uh, me personally <laughs> there was a guy dressed up as guy fieri at my job yesterday as well as the person from the uh, australian break dancing team uh, uh go ahead sophia's uh teacher dressed up in probably one of the greatest costumes i've seen in a long time she dressed up as maleficent mm. she had the green paint on and the headdress and everything and for a preschool teacher uh i was like wow that's impressive there's also somebody dressed up as einstein when i was walking to the train and the wind blew their wig off and they were chasing it down the uh down the street which is pretty funny it'd be cooler i mean not einstein is very cool but it'd be cool if it was a young einstein from the 1980s that uh movie if you don't remember with yahoo yeah. serious i think was serious the man who's the man who sued yahoo or his name <laughs> yes 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 all right uh let's get into our first segment tone let's go into what we've been watching my guy all right let's do it that's a me and also you just watching so what were you watching this week my guy okay first off these are probably my two favorite things to watch during halloween time first up is uh it's the great pumpkin charlie brown which if you're talking cartoons i probably watch this one the most i probably watch this one seventeen thousand three hundred and forty two times no i don't know i don't know if i counted that much but i love this cartoon because for me it really embodies everything that is awesome about well um halloween um it's awesome about just some great humor some great lines one of the greatest lines in this cartoon is um the three things you never talk about are politics religion and the great pumpkin a uh, great line right there as is this one hey i got a candy bar boy i got three cookies hey i got a package of gum I got a rock. Now, you know me, um, but I love music. Um, for me personally, I just got done doing the 31 Days countdown with different songs. But to me, the ultimate uh, Halloween music for me is uh, Vincent Giraldi's soundtrack for The Great Pumpkin. You can play this, and honestly, the sounds. Um, this is what I grew up on. This was played, honestly, like more than anything that should have been played at my age. I just love this so much. Charlie Brown, the basic story is really quickly. Charlie Brown is, um, well, he is uh, 
is, is trick or treating. A great pumpkin is involved, meaning that, uh, you know, how, how do I explain it? Um, the great pumpkin is a myth, and um, Linus uh, taught sits in the pumpkin patch all night waiting for this myth to show up. There's a great Halloween party where Charlie Brown is involved. It's a great time. I just love this movie. And Snoopy is the ultimate OG with the uh, his little uh, um, Woodstock. How could I forget him? Because he's named after uh, the great festival or town. So very cool um, little cartoon. What do you think of the Great Pumpkin? Uh, I love all peanut stuff. Uh, I do get kind of pissed that they treat Charlie Brown like trash. Uh, Lucy used to irritate me when she pulled the damn you know, football from him. I, I love the family guy thing. It's one of the few family things, fa- guy things I find funny is when he uh, is, does the roadhouse skit and he just starts uh-huh. kicking the shit out of her. And so you will hold that football for Charlie Brown. Uh, but, you know, the Great Pumpkins are good. We were just talking about that actually the other day because Sally, Charlie Brown's sister, goes out with Linus to the pumpkin patch and then Linus redeems himself with the Easter Beagle for uh, Easter when the Easter Beagle actually shows up as <laughs> well, Snoopy's Easter Beagle. But I remember she was complaining that she used to wait all night in that pumpkin patch for a great pumpkin. And finally he got redeemed when the Easter Beagle showed up. But uh, the great pumpkin is a, a great cartoon. Still holds up to this day. Uh, peanuts are always great to watch. That's, uh, th- I think that's just generally the cart. That's because a student asked me that question. Is I think that's the whole peanuts thing is that everyone else is superior to Charlie Brown. And Charlie Brown is sadly treated like a heel. Where really he's like the nicest one out of all of them, and he should be treated with the most respect, and that's what makes it for a, a ridiculous cartoon. Um, the next thing I watched, Jump, you, know, you know how much we talked about a little bit last week Tales from the Crypt. Um, we can go on forever, which I'm sure we will one day. Um, so many great episodes. Um, for me, um, what I just loved growing up were just the amazing cameos that uh, were involved in the show. Oh, do to stay young. What's the matter with you? You want to keep that 90 pound corpse for the rest of your death? Keep pumping. Well, I tell the story. Now, just that episode right there, which was directed by Schwarzenegger, um, had just a pair of really really awesome actors in it um it had uh mr rick rosovich which was in the first terminator um and he switches bodies with um the cool old man from um christmas story um his name is belittering me off the top of my head um but he's the one with the voice who's like oh he's in a couple other things too he's in um tales from the dark side he's in a couple of things but uh they switch bodies through the whole entire episode. Um, it's like a transformation. Um, real cool episode. A lot of cool episodes. Uncle Felix. Episode. Yes. There you go. Uncle Felix. Yes. Um, what was your couple of your favorite episodes of Tales from the Crypt? Yep. That one's one of my favorites. The uh, dummy one with Don Rickles is one of my favorites. Uh, also, the... Uh, uh, off the top of my head, the one where the guy kills all the women who, like older women, he buries them and yes. kills them off. Yes, and, and then they, That's a good yeah, one. and then they end up coming back and uh, as the you getting know him? getting oh, him. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great one. And another one is the little boy who's actually a werewolf, but he gets taken in by the vampires. Yes, that's a good one. That's like that. Uh, you're just naming classics here. Um, I mean. When you think back to a lot of the people who are in the show, there's a really great episode with the uh, little old lady from Poltergeist um, where she has this house and she has this little girl named Felicity. And um, what ends up happening is is the radio host goes to the uh, thing because she calls in and says, come to my house. you got to help me with my little girl. And he ends up going into pretty much a house of horrors. Um, what I loved about the show mostly was that it was like 30 minutes, a huge twist, Pretty taller, a pretty comparable story, and big name directors from Robert Zemeckis, um, you know, all the way down to Tom Hanks directed episode, you know, just lots and lots of star power. Um, it's a shame that for a while they try to put it back together. I know M. Night Shyamalan tried on TNT, but the tough part about all this is there's just so much uh copyrights to all this from 
a long time ago. I guess it's kind of like from what I was doing research. It's like the old Beavis and Buttheads with all the music videos. Back then, they were able to play those music videos with the Beavis and Butthead because it was MTV. But then when they started doing the DVDs, you couldn't put the music videos on there because you had to go get the licensing and all of that. So, um, But I just love that concept, and I really wish something as big as that was back in the time on something like HBO Max I think would be really cool. Yeah, it really would be cool. Uh, I wouldn't mind uh, a newer film coming out, like around, kind of like a feature film, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's best sometimes just leaving the classic, the classic it is, because we're just getting sometimes a little too much remakes, and maybe we wouldn't like it. Like just this week, they just announced a couple days ago, a cliffhanger remake is coming, Um, and Sly will not be involved with it. I know you're very sad being a Tusk. I know. But he could play the Lithgow part, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. He's like uh, 80. <laughs> I, well, again, he's going to probably be in another Rocky or Rambo before it's said and done. So um, that being said, what have you watched? Oh, speak of the devil. You know what's ironic is, again, I didn't even realize one of your picks was. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So this week, I actually watched a Sly film. So I did the 31 Days of Horror. So I watched horror movies the whole month. Uh, even when I was editing, even when I was doing other stuff, I watched them. I had them on when I was working just to kind of get ideas of how I want my, whenever I do a video, I have it like picture it in my mind and I figure out what little bits I want to put in. I'd like to watch the movie and then go over, you know, what parts I might could in the video and then what little humorous, stupid, dumb things I think are funny. I put in there at, with my script. So I watched a ton of horror movies this year. So I kind of wanted to cleanse the palate a little bit and watch a little bit something different. So I went back to an old favorite of mine, the uh, classic that should have been nominated for many Oscars, the Taco Bell war-winning movie of uh, Devolution Man with Sylvester Sloan and Wesley Snipes, which is hilariously bad, but so bad it's good. <laughs> well, I'll be really honest with you. Again, I hate to... It's... It's almost like sometimes like you grew up in the house, the same house as me, because this was another one, man. I mean, I, I keep thinking of what was the movie that my dad played the most. And man, he loved Demolition Man. And like to the point where he would have honestly said a kid, he everything from the shells all the way down to the Taco Bell to honestly, Wesley Snipes does a great job in this movie. Um, really, really good job. And me being exactly the age I was when this came out, this was my wheelhouse. I mean, it was like, and now, of course, you look back at it and is there's some cheesiness to it. And it, there is, you know, I like Sandra Bullock, but, you know, there's just some things that maybe I could have switched around. But a great fun movie. I mean, a great fun movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's some cheesiness to it, but it's got a lot of nostalgia to it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, of course, uh, Sylvester Stallone and Wesley Snipes, their first big matchup, uh, which is kind of funny because Stallone really wanted Jackie Chan to be the villain. And in Asian cinema, if you're a hero most of the time and you become a villain, they recognize you as a villain from then on. So he didn't want to switch over to be a villain, which is why probably Jackie Chan's never really played a villain in any of his movies. But, uh, you know, it has like even Jesse Ventura's in this film. He plays a little small part as one of the guys they bring back. You know, you had the guy from Beetlejuice, uh, Otho is in here. Otho. Yeah. Uh, yeah Otho. You know, Dennis Leary's in here with his, uh, wants to rub jello all over his body and run around naked as he talks about, you know, they eat a rat burger. So <laughs> got a lot of classic stuff in it. At this time, I mean, me not knowing really anything about food. I mean, Taco Bell was one of my favorite things. So like seeing Taco Bell in this movie, like, wow it's gonna be a restaurant one day um that was kind of cool and um a lot of memorable quotes you know i mean the movie's loaded with with classic memorable quotes be well yeah uh and the second movie i watched this week you know i trashed the crow yeah nothing beats a good rat burger jack i trashed the crow remake i didn't really like it uh so and i did say that wicked prayer was better I went and watched Rickard Prayer, and I barely got through that. Uh, but I will say, I still prefer it over the Crow remake. <laughs> so, 
And crazy thing was, the thing that kind of caught my interest for this film, The Crow Rooked Prayer, was that apparently DMX had talked about reviving the series or the uh, franchise, and he wanted to have himself be a record executive who got killed by another Mongol who was going to be played by Eminem, and he was going to come back and try to kill him. That would have been a pretty awesome uh, crow, as DMX would have been the crow coming back. But, uh, you know, it was about to, it was, I think it was going to be, gonna give it to you. Yeah, he was going to be called the Crow Lazarus. Ooh, interesting. So he was killed. Maybe he was trying to do the uh, early, like, play off the, you know, the deaths of Tupac and Biggie, maybe something like that. But Eminem was supposed to be the bad guy, and everybody kind of pretty much hated Eminem at this time in <laughs> 2000 because of the stuff he was talking about. But, that would have been kind of cool. But yeah, I definitely prefer The Crow Wicked Prayer over The Crow Remake. Uh, Johnny Cuervo over, uh, you know, Bill Skarsgård. But <laughs> to each their own, I guess. I uh, always remember uh, uh, a buddy of mine was like, you should come over to my friend's house. Uh, we're going to watch this movie. So I was like, sure, where does he live? And he let me know. And I went over there and I walked in and the movie had already started. This was the movie. and. I never really wish, like, usually I'm one of them, in my mind, at least people, you know, I, I'm telling jokes, watching movies. I sat there and these guys had the commentary of this movie of the gold that I wish I could play for you tonight. Um, I've never laughed so hard and watched such a pathetic movie all in one. Um, but, you know, I'm with you. I could see that I would still enjoy this one more than the new one because what they did to it, what they did to my boy, what they just... Just what they did. And and honestly, with this one, even with the box, see, I love Edward Furlong in movies like Brain Scan. So like, or Tara Reed in American Pie. So I could be like, okay, this is cheesy enough where I can enjoy it for them. That other movie, I like Bill Skarsgård in it. There's nothing he's cheesy in. So watching him in The Crow doesn't give me that same cheesy feeling. So if that makes sense yeah i mean in this one you got uh tito ortiz you got tara reed like you said uh david yeah. barandas from angels in there danny trejo is in this one dennis hopper is also in this one you know you got some people that you know even though the movie's not that great don't get me wrong the other one just felt like they rehashed an idea just for cash grab and i'm glad it failed so <laughs> All right, i don't want to harp on this because i would just go on a tangent but uh that's what we watched this week. Let us know what you watched over at the At The Show podcast, over on Twitter, or X, or whatever Elon decides to name it after the election. Uh, you can check us out up on Facebook and let us know there as well. Or just let us know at our own handles at Lil Yumper or The Sugar Baggy. Tony, I love your little thing on the bottom. Hey, lady, thanks for the ride. Okay. I know, don't you? I said to switch it up tonight. But uh, with that tone... Let's talk about a little thing we have going on over at the Statistic Penguin Studios. Uh, as everyone knows, we have one of our buddies, uh, Gordo, who's a big supporter of the show and also of everything we do with the Statistic Penguins, as well as the Chicago Sports Bums and the from the 108. Uh, Gordo has, has to have a surgery soon, and he's going to need some help with his medical bills. So all of us has banded together the... From the 108 and the Chicago Sports Bums have a GoFundMe out there for him where you could just go to his Vimo and send him money for his medical bills. We also thought about doing something for Gordo and having a shirt made up with him with the hashtag Gummy Strong with our own little twisted spin on Gordo's penguin with a penguin with a long beard and the Willy Wonka suit. Uh, we want to have you know that out for Gordo. So all proceeds that are bought from this shirt will go to Gordo. We already gave him our first payment. We had some people buy, I think, uh, buy some shirts recently. Uh, so everything that we make from this, we make no profit of it. So you just buy it, you buy a shirt, all the proceeds go to Gordo for his medical bills. Uh, we're going to keep this up there until Gordo's uh, surgery, which will be happening later this month. If you can, please grab a shirt and uh, help out our guy. He's a good dude. Probably one of the nicest guys I know. And uh, he also hooks people up with gummies. Yeah. Very gummy strong, Gordo. Yeah. Very gummy strong. Very awesome. We want you to get better, and it's awesome that we've already made some cash and are sending it his way. Yes, so I dropped the link inside the chat. Tone will add the link in the video description as well as the podcast description. So if you got some extra uh, cash that you uh, you want to help out, it's 30 bucks a shirt. The shirts are nice quality. Roxy posted an awesome picture on Twitter of it. Uh, I have to order mine this week. 
Me too. I haven't got, uh, they're really nice. I really like the design. And we sent Gordo actually a custom mug. Shout out to Brian, Magnificent Very Stan, good. who got a mug out to him with a logo and a shirt. So look, you know, help support one of our guys who is always there with us. Yes, please. Please do that. Because anytime you can help out anybody who's in need like this, especially somebody who supports small time awesome podcasts like this one and all the other awesome podcasts he supports definitely deserves it yeah so shout out to gordo also a big shout out to the one only baloney happy birthday i think he turned 50 today uh shout out to him for his 50th i know he had the uh bums happy hour earlier i caught a little bit of it uh, i actually took a nap so usually during that time i'm having a nap time because i'm an old man but shout out to baloney uh, we love you buddy and happy birthday yeah, uh, watch a Marvel movie on us. <laughs> uh, but with that tone, we're going to get into this list of films that we got going, my man. We said that the films would be about some Halloween leftovers. So we picked some films that are some horror films that basically you might know and you may uh, you may not know. I picked two films that are foreign. So usually we do when we do the old format we have a sound clip played so for two of my picks i'm going to have to do a video clip because one is in korean and the other one is in spanish uh, i know we do have spanish speakers that listen to the show but i don't know if we have any korean speakers that listen to the show but uh just to be fair if you want to see the clips check us out on the youtube at Statistical studios on the youtubes if you want to see the clips but i will play them they're about six and eight seconds long uh for those two clips and then we have you know the usual list of 10 tone you ready to get to this let's do it Cool. Let's start off with our first film here. Two thousand four Shutter, the Japanese version, is which I picked. And if you saw the clip, it was actually the appearance of the girl, that girl going through the car. The film was directed by Ban Jong. Excuse me, my pronunciations here, people. Pisa Takunin. <laughs> And Parpum Wanpum. I don't know if I said that correctly. I'm sorry. Starring Amanda Everingham, Nata Rinrich, Thongmi, and Achita Sikamana. It had a box office of 6.9 million. Now, if you followed me for the 31 Days of Horror this year, I actually did a video on this. The reason that I picked this film is because one, the American version gets talked about a lot with Pacey from uh lawson's creek when you first brought it up that's where i thought we were going i'm like wow yeah i know that no no and then i got to we'll get to it no keep yeah going. no uh so that one is not as good as the original you know sometimes the american versions are decent like the ring was a good the grudge was actually a decent remake for the american version uh, audience but this one i think it does it better in terms of the horror with the girl you know, the all around story of a guy who is basically haunted by a woman that he doesn't know why him and his girlfriend, she, they think they hit her on the street in a car accident, but in reality, there's a big twist at the end of why she's following them. Uh, she appears in their pictures. She haunts them. She terrorizes them. And it basically goes through, you know, the trials and tribulations of trying to get rid of her, uh, has one of the best twist endings, I think for horror films, in my opinion, that I've seen. And it's nicely shot. It gives you a lot of suspense. It builds on a lot of, you know, you're thinking she's going to come and then she's there. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of gore in it, which is kind of cool that you can have horror without gore, even though she looks kind of jacked up. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of depressing as well. It has a nice little story to it. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend checking out the Shutter Japanese version, uh, the Korean version. Uh, this is actually, if you look hard enough, you can find it on YouTube and you can watch it there. Uh, or you can stream it to your Prime or... I think it's on Netflix as well, but you can stream it there, but it's totally worth the watch. Uh, foreign horror is always good to kind of get a different taste of how the world sees horror than the way that the American versions are, or the American audiences. It's always nice to see a perspective outside of what we're used to, and you know, it's been influencing us for so long that people don't really realize that. Uh, you know, I just did thing on Demons, which people are like, oh, that, but that was directed by one like the best people from Italy. <laughs> so, so it's always cool to check out foreign horror. This is a good one to check out. Tone, have you, I'm guessing you haven't seen this one. Let me just start with your amazing 31 Days of Horror. Um, starting with Demons all the way out 
you pretty much was banger after ba like Seamus banger after banger after banger. I mean, <laughs> you like movies, like, and honestly, I had never seen demons before and I had never seen this before. And I had watched both of them since watching your videos. Um, demons is awesome. And this is really cool too, because I was only familiar with the Joshua Jackson version. And honestly, it's not because it, it yes yes we work together and we are friends and that's why i love your videos but if i just stumbled across that video and i'd never seen those movies i probably i would have felt the same exact way you know because these are movies that i have not been exposed to um but i remember seeing like we talked about before those old vhs boxes the demons box um just never saw the movie and this one i knew uh was a remake um but really, really scary. Um, very, very scary um, when it's portrayed. For me, sometimes, um, sometimes the original can even be because you can feel a little bit more. I don't want to say the passion versus the remake because you know the remake was taken after this, where this is the original version of the artist. Um, but really cool pick. Yeah, if you hit, the originals always seem to be better. Uh, it's very rare that the you know remakes are better, but they do kind of hold up depending on how they're done. Uh, I just prefer this one over the other one. I think the other one was a little too more watered down than this one. But yeah, definitely. You know, if you haven't seen this, the original, check it out. I let me know what you think. I know what turns people off is subtitles, but sometimes you have the dubs. I rather read the subtitles because I don't the when they're dubbed and they're not. They're dubbed poorly. I don't, I don't like that. So I'd rather be the subtitles of what's going on. Uh, and I like to hear the original the or, or original voice of the actors. That's just my thing. But the two actors that play in here, uh, Manning Abraham and uh, I can't say it, Thong Mi is his last name. Uh, they are awesome. Like they, you feel their, pa their passion, their pain, their you fear throughout the whole film. Uh, so it's definitely worth a watch. I'll, real quick, I always remember in... Uh... I was like, uh, I was a junior and the senior was talking about uh, going to see this movie uh, downtown uh, called Firework. And it was uh, in subtitles. And I was like, and I'm like, I've never, I don't know, man. I don't know. I've never been, out of the, you know, but then I asked my good friend, like, you want to come with? And my good friend said, yes. So we went up going. And it honestly was another amazing experience where I said to myself after uh, I watching the movie and watching this awesome movie downtown in subtitles like you gotta get out and go to these cool theaters in chicago you know i mean i was only then a junior i mean it's not like i was even 18 or anything but still it's an experience and and opening yourself up to see these type of movies i think are i think it's a good thing yeah definitely uh but that's shutter check it out Tell them, let's, uh, let's get into your next movie, my man. Let's do it. I mean, I got something to say, you know. What do you think this is all about? You think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. Oh, yes. <sighs> hey, what's wrong with you, man? <sighs> Show some fucking respect for the dead, will ya? 1985's Return of the Living Dead, directed by Dan O'Bannon, who also directed the film The Resurrected, but he wrote some bangers. He wrote Alien, Aliens, Dark Star, Heavy Metal, and Total Recall. He wrote the screenplay for that. The film stars Clue Gallagher, James Karen, Don Calfa, Miguel Nunez Jr., John Philbin, and Beverly Randolph. It had a budget of $4 million and a box office of $14 million. Tone, tell me why you picked this one, my man. Oh, it's got everything. Music, which I love. The soundtrack, the punk rock soundtrack is amazing. Um, for a zombie movie, um, what I like is that it. I like the cheesy aspects of it. I love the brains, the uh, just the the overall um, the. I don't want to say cosmic. What are they? Uh, the gra the way the um, art department got together and was able to really put together creature effects. The way the yeah, the way the creature effects look, especially in like. When they're in the graveyard um then of course you've got just the interaction clue gallagher does a really good job in this movie um and just really brings out a lot of the uh i think one of the my favorite zombie movies personally because it's it's got it all it's not 
super serious like the original uh night of the living dead but then it's not like super 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 stupid like maybe uh i can't even think of a super super stupid one off the top of my head but this one is one that i enjoy because especially the music mixed with the zombies definitely got to see it yeah and the crazy thing is john a russo who worked with george a romero on the night of the living dead the original in 69 he was one of the writers for this film and the reason they broke up from their partnership was because they both had different ideas on how they wanted to do a sequel of course romero went with dawn of the living dead which is an awesome film uh, i actually like that and the re- and the remake which are i mean the remake's not as good as the original but i like both of them uh but you know this film was russo's idea and this is one of the first actually i think i believe this is the first film where zombies actually talk if you want to count white zombie i think it's more of a you know uh, hypnotizing with the logo see back in the day but this one it, you know the zombies actually talk and tell you what they want uh the creature effects are awesome yeah, i believe tom savini actually worked on these as well uh toby hooper was actually you know in talks to direct this film in 3d which i think in 3d Ooh. it would have been kind of crappy but <laughs> You know, this film holds up today. I love the punk rock aspect of it. You know, I love all the characters in here. Miguel uh, Nunez, who you might remember for Juana Man. He's also in a bunch of other films. He was homeless during this. And this was like his, one of his first big breaks. You know, I got him to go out there. Uh, I love the fact that they had a nice little backstory of this toxin that basically brought them back to life. And when they burned the bodies, it, you know, it wouldn't spread <laughs> to the graveyards. It's just cool to, like, the whole, uh, you know, creature effects of it, like they're showing a picture right now of the, they call him Tar Man, which is a collectible figure. You know, he's renowned in the horror circles. It just has that everything you want in horror comedy, scary, you know, it has great story. And it's something you can still watch today and it still holds up. Uh, it's not what you would put with your kids, but it's an adult comedy that, you know, go, adult comedy horror that you would like. And I thought it was really, really well done. And the crazy thing is when this film came out, some people are like, wait, is this the sequel to Night of the Living Dead? Because it had a return. And no, it wasn't, but it was a nice ploy to get people to go watch it. Yeah. I mean, again, as Dawn of the Dead feels like late 70s, this feels like 80s. Um, the soundtrack is kicking. And again, the costumes, not even the zombie costumes, but just the costumes of the North, like the Mohawks and and, and cool cool uh chains and and all of that it i remember specifically i had never even seen the movie and i had had a lot of moving and, and some of the first kids that i talked to going into eighth grade moving from illinois into indiana they listen to punk rock and the movie they talked about was this movie because to them it, it, it em- emphasized how awesome punk rock was and that mixed with as you stated the creature effects really cool yeah it's the creature effects are awesome in this film uh i also found just when doing research that the uh, filmmakers had got had to get approval from lysol uh to have frank spray away the stench of death with their product they liked the idea that lysol will kill any conceivable or odor so they're like okay that's cool so they gave them got some advertising there because it smelled so bad when they were spraying the creature effects are awesome in this film. Watch this film just for that alone. Like, yeah. it's totally worth it. One of the most famous scenes is probably not just Tar Man, which is what you have right now, but the scene where they have the zombie strapped to the table and she tells them why, they, uh, oh, yeah. why they're living and what they're looking for. And she basically says that they want brains because it cures their pain. It's a really cool scene uh, when half the body's up. And also, you know, the, just the, uh, the effects of like the half the body guy that's walking around that they hit with a flashlight little stuff like that it's a it's a good film to watch uh, and it still holds up great graveyard dance scene too yes yes great graveyard dance scene uh, so check out return of the living dead that's a good pick tone i was really happy when i saw this one awesome thank you all right my friend let's go into our next film and here's the clip for this one. Ooh, no sound came with it redonkulous but that is a film called The Skin I Live In, which was released in 2011, directed by Pedro Alamodovar, who directed Parallel Mothers, The Room Next Door, Pain and Glory, and Volver. 
the film starred Anthony Bander uh, Anthony Banderas, Antonio Banderas, Alina Alena, Jan Cornette, and Marisa Paredes. The film had a box office of 33 million and a budget of 10 million. The reason I picked this film, another one I went through for 31 Days of Horror, but this film is masterfully shot because it is not a horror film that does like a lot of serial killing or a lot of slashers or hauntings. It's basically a film that basically goes into ethics and paying a penance for what you did. Uh, it goes into a, based, uh, a plastic surgeon who had lost his wife and something bad happens to his daughter. And he decides I to take revenge on all that by recreating his ex-wife, uh, you know, his deceased wife. And I won't get into too much atten- you know, detail on who he does it to but and why he does it to them. But it's basically if you had a person with no, you know, no moral ethics for being a doctor and being able to do what they want and having people being able to do what they want, you know, what would you do? What would the world be? I mean, it's been rumors about people doing this now and, you know, quack doctors, but this guy was actually working on synthetic skin to help people and burn victims and whatnot. And he used that good for bad, which it can happen in the medical industry. It makes you think it's really, really, really good in terms of psychological horror. Banderas, who is usually known for having tics and whatnot when acting, was told to drop all that. He was told to be as menacing and as cold as he could be, and he's a complete asshole in this film. Uh, he plays like his role masterfully. Again, this film is in Spanish, so if you haven't seen it, you know I greatly, greatly, you know, encourage you to watch it. It does have dubbing. It does have subtitles again, but it's another film that like. Amoldovar does a great job of pushing horror on you, and you really, really, you know, feel the victim's pain in this, as well as the, you kind of feel a little bit sorry for Manderas as well when you learn his backstory. But it's totally worth, you know, watching. Have you seen this film, Tom? Um, I saw it when it first came out. Um, I went out, I think there was a while where I saw every Banderas movie. Um, that he was putting out um and this one i think what drew it to me was actually the box when it first came out but then when you uh, brought it back to me and honestly i saw another great video that you did um because what i like with some of your picks is you didn't go for straight horror you can go for psychological uh horror is different in so many different ways um to me one of the scariest movies for me would be uh, like a, a movie like apocalypse now just Martin Sheen, what he goes through, but that's not horror, you know what I mean? So, like, I understand exactly what you're saying. The performance of Antonio Banderas is is really, really good in this movie, um, as they are in a lot of his movies. But as you said, um, I like menacing uh, Antonio Banderas. I like cold and calculated Antonio Banderas, and he pulls it off very well in this movie. Yeah, it's he's done a really, really good job. Also, you know, uh, the character of Elena, well, the actress of Elena uh, Anaya does a great job, as well as, you know, Jan, Jan Cornette does a great job in here for the uh, person that is a victim. It's a great, it's, I, I love the prosthetics in here. I love the way they made the person look when, you know, you're showing a great scene of how they have the plastic over her face to make a little, the transformation going, and you see him cutting, and it's just, crazy like even when you find out the story you're just like damn that's really really fucked up and in the end it's kind of like stockholm syndrome what happens yeah you know uh and they finally get turned but but i don't want to give too much away but it's it's just out there you have to watch this film you know i can this this film i think has really is climbing up my list of like favorite horror films because it's something different and i always you know look for something different and when i first saw this film was maybe about six years ago uh, I've heard of it, but I never watched it. And when I finally watched it, I was like, damn, you know, I got to watch that again. So I try to watch, sneak this one in every year just to uh, get a feel for it. And that's why I included this year on 31 Days of Horror. Um, one thing that I always like, Katie will look over at me. I think she thinks I'm on social media. Like what I actually do is like, I spent so much time just, just reading about the director of this movie um, and his other movies and just kind of like his beginning I love doing that. I love finding an, uh, somebody who I don't know anything about, especially in the realm of movies or music, 
and just finding a story from the beginning and seeing like all the different things. And that's the same thing. I mean, I've done that with Antonio Banderas and this is a great example of another good director that doesn't get uh, talked about a lot. Yeah. So if we can, on the show, if we can kind of sway you to a new director, new type of, it was if it's horror or a movie or a style of movie that you've never seen, that's, you know, we've done our job. Uh, it's also your opinion. Like, if you want to see it and you tell me it sucks, then it sucks. I mean, there, it's, it's to each their own, but it's worth trying out. So kind of branch out if you're like a film lover into those foreign films, because some of them are worth watching. It's true. All right, my man. So let's go into your next film. Kick him in the nose! Kick him in the nose! He just hit a Go in, go in! Wolfman's got nards. Come on, come on! 1987's Monster Squad, directed by Fred Deckler. Fred Decker, who directed Night with of the Creeps, RoboCop Three, and he also wrote films such as The Predator, Godzilla 1985, a Keelan classic House, If Looks Could Kill, and Ricochet. The film stars Andrew Gower, Andre Gower. Robbie Keeger, Stephen Mock, Duncan Rager, Tom Noonan, Stan Shaw, Brian Lambert, Ashley Bank, and Bre- Brett Calum. The movie had a box office of $12 million on a budget. No, actually, it had a budget of $12 million and a box office of $3 million with six hundred and twelve dollars for a home market release. That's crazy that this film didn't make money. I thought it did. Uh, tell, tell me why you picked this one nostalgia purposes uh multiple reasons um i had a tape um it had this and the lost boys on it and i would just watch them back to back to back to back to back um what i liked about it is because it had everybody it had the mummy it had dracula it had the wolf man um uncle rico from um uh napoleon dynamite playing uh the werewolf really cool Mm -hmm. um i if you ever were like it if you if someone was like man you guys don't do deep cuts i would love to just do a show on tom noonan i'm a huge tom noonan stand from everything from manhunter to easy money with uh rodney dangerfield all the way back to his great performance as frankenstein um honestly i think i cried uh, a lot as a kid watching this movie just because they were going to hurt Frankenstein at the end, but then at the end, you know, he saved them. It's just a, a real cool. There's, there's everything for somebody who's like a 12 or 13 year old looking for, and you want to be part of the monster squad. You want to be the cool guy with the leather jacket who the girl looks at and is like, yeah, him. I mean, that's who I wanted to be when I watched this movie. I just, I like it for those reasons. It's like yeah. Stand By Me, but like with Wolfman. You know what I mean? Yeah. Of course, it has the universal, it's based off the universal characters, you know, the universal movie monsters. Uh, but due to licensing issues, they couldn't get the exact, you know, appearances of them. So, you know, if you look at it, like the creature from Black Lagoon, we know him as a creature from Black Lagoon. But in this movie, he's known as Gilman. Because they couldn't get the exact licenses, which kind of sucked, but they did a great job of kind of pulling in, you know, you know who they're talking about in here. Uh, Dracula always cracked me up when he tells that little girl, you little bitch. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> At least she just screams. It's a, it's a great kids movie, but it's also got some scary parts in it. You know, I remember watching this when I was younger and I was like, oh man, you know, it's crazy that they're trying to hurt Frankenstein, but it also cracked me up that, you know, Wolfman's got nards when they kick him in the nuts. <laughs> Uh, it's got a nice transformation scene of the Wolfman. It's got yeah. the uh, Creature of Black Lagoon coming out. You know, Dracula's badass. And it has Stephen Mock, who, if first time I saw him was in Graveyard Shift. And then, you know, he was in this film. And then he, later on, for those who are Suits fans, he plays one of the pro- Professor Gerard in the Suits. Oh. As actually the father of Gabriel Mock, who plays Harvey Specter. So it's kind of cool seeing them act in the Suits together. But yeah, it's uh, it's crazy that he was in the Monster Squad. When I was looking at his filmography a while ago, I'm like, oh shit, he was in the Monster Squad. But you know, Tom Noonan is awesome in this film. It's got some uh, some great little tidbits in it, and I you know highly recommend you watch this one as well. Again, like you know, um, it, it reminds me a lot of these movies, especially from the '80s. They just seem like 
I could sit in a movie theater and watch this and a return of the living dead back to back and have just such a great time. And one is obviously a lot more rated R than this one, but there's just so put together so well. Um, again, gives off vibes of pre, 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 pre stranger things before stranger things, you know, kids getting together to fight forces. In this case, it's, you know, uh, Transylvania's, uh, you know, own Dracula, you know, the whole, the way the circle opens at the end, you know, the graphics, you know, they're, they're okay, you know, but again, that's not, it's the story. And I think it, it holds up. I could see why it didn't probably do well back then from my gathering. The marketing just didn't, uh, wasn't there. I don't think, you know, a lot of movies from gathering, talking to people around at that time, you know, some of these movies weren't like you see today with a lot of trailers. It was like maybe a couple and that's kind of maybe what got lost in the fold. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's unfortunate because this would i could see this becoming like a series or a franchise if it really popped off but you know it just didn't work out maybe they were kind of over the monster movie stuff kind of in in 89 i mean again you know lost boys came out in 87 maybe they were still kind of they had the hangover of that the kids horror films i don't know it could be what's what is this movie's audience you know is it adults is it young kids? Because there are parts that are a little scary for like a 11 year old or a 10 year old for parents in the movie theater. So it's like, what, what are we going for here? And 18 year olds aren't going to go want to see the monster. You know, you just don't know. That is totally true. Totally true. Uh, two little tidbits before we go. Two people had roles in this film that were cut out. One was paid and that was Liam Neeson. <laughs> he had a bit part that was cut. Uh, so Liam Neeson, if you know him from Taken, uh, he's also Raja Ghul in uh, Batman, uh, the first Batman, the first Nolan Batman. And then Dustin Diamond Screech had a small role as a kid who tries to trade baseball cards with the boys, but that was later cut as well. <laughs> so two uh, two iconic people in their own right were in this film and their thing was cut. But if you haven't seen The Monster Squad, check it out. It, it still holds up today. It's a cool little film. This is a film you could actually could watch with your kids, maybe a little older. It does have some scary parts, but it's mostly like a family movie, and I, I recommend this one as well. But, Tone, let's get into our next one, my man. Let's do it. This thing. It's going to follow you. Somebody gave it to me. And I passed it to you. Back in the car. It could look like someone you know, or it could be a stranger in a crowd. 2014's It Follows, directed by David Robert Mitchell, who also did The Myth of the American Sleepover and Under the Silver Lake. This film stars um, Maika Monroe, Keir Gilchrist, Olivia Lucardi, Lily Speepy, and Bailey Spry. The film had a budget of around a million dollars and a box office of 21 million. This is another one of my picks. I Again, I did this for 31 Days of Horror. It seems like I'm just picking movies from that. But this is a film that, again, I wanted to, when I was doing this list for leftovers, I wanted to do stuff that is not really talked about a lot. This film is another film that is not really talked about a lot. And it has a cool concept. We talked about Smile 2 uh, last week with Keelan. And we kind of went over the original smile, you know, that kind of concept of having an ST follow you. This kind of has that kind of concept with it, but this one's actually passed sexually to, and the entity doesn't just run up on you. It follows you slowly, which makes it even creepier. You know, you, I love the way that David Robert Mitchell shot this because there's certain scenes where they're just panning the camera and you see people walking very slow and you're like, well, is that it? Is that the entity? Or not, you know, you, and then you have those scenes like the beach scene where they, the kid breaks through the uh, the hole in the door and scares the shit out of him. Or, you know, the uh, old lady or even the beginning is awesome where she's running from it and you don't see it right away. Just stuff like that. And then you find they find her on the, the beach all messed up. It's awesome that the way it builds tension and also the score 
by that disaster piece for this film is fucking phenomenal. I would play it, but we but we we'll get copyright for it. But watch the, if you like music, like score music, the score for this is really really good. Tone, have you seen this film? Yes, uh, me and Katie went to the movie theaters and saw this one. And as you stated, it's an original piece of horror work here. Um, definitely like what they were doing with this one. Um, a lot of good performances inside the movie too itself. Um, the camera work is, I think, one of the greatest stars in the movie. The cinematography too, I guess you would call it, the way that they are using the camera. Um, highly innovative. Yeah, extremely. And like I said, you, even when it pans or the blur of the camera, you see like something walking slowly. That's one of my favorite parts too. And that you just showed right now, Tone, is the uh, the tall guy, it. You know, the very tall it they call him. And that person is named Mike Laner, and he actually is seven seven. Wow. And he's one half of the world's tallest twins from Detroit. His wow. twin brother is seven seven. Yeah. So that's ridiculous uh and you know you some you can't see what's going on which is kind of like a you know precursor to smile but it's just a totally different kind of concept of this is passed on so actually there's no way to get rid of it while smile you have to witness something but i like both types of films i think this one was done really well i'm also a big fan of uh, micah monroe who was in long legs i know some people don't like long legs i actually liked it and i like the way she you know, her two characters in both films because she's a little more outspoken, but in this film, like you said, the cinematography, you kind of looks like you're going through a dream. The way they go through the city of Detroit, and then they go like they find, you know, when they see the entity and whatnot, you see it, it's like you're going through like a dream world, and that's what's kind of cool about it. But just for cinematography, and I think the score alone, it's awesome. You might be like, "Why are you laughing?" And I thought about one of your videos that you did, and it was like, "Yes, oh, it was people under the stairs," and you're like got serious mommy and daddy issues <laughs> yeah mommy mommy daddy <laughs> long legs i love long legs yeah I threw, that, I, threw that, I threw that in there for uh keelan that was good, you haven't that seen was... that one I, I texted her too when i released that I'm like there's a little easter egg in there for good. you and she like that was, laughed that was really good yeah uh i throw in easter eggs for like people that we talk to so yeah. sometimes a joke might yeah. be like the uh even in that one the p the fool oh yeah the Mr. T, yeah. I threw that in there for Brian because I knew he was gonna he would laugh at that one. Good uh, stuff. Good stuff. But yeah, but back to this film. If you haven't seen this one, definitely check it out. It's kind of crazy that a lot, you know, David Robert Mitchell hasn't really done anything since you know under the Silver Lake. He's working on stuff, but these concepts of horror are really good. Uh, new concepts, new ideas. I think this is kind of like changing. Even Jordan Peele, I might not like all his movies, but just something different is something good, That's and. Right. That's where you'll get, you know, the change and where horror is heading in that direction. You need new, new direction, new stories, new ideas. And that's all film. Like we're kind of getting that abundance of uh, remakes, but get that new, new blood in there to check it out and to have people experience. So this is a good film to watch. It's creepy, atmospheric, uh, and so like again, I can't stress how great the cinematography is uh, for this one. You know, and I don't. You don't know if he was right or wrong, but to to go what you were saying of new and fresh, even today, Quentin Tarantino said, uh, I'm not going to watch that new Dune. Um, I've already seen it. Too many remakes. I want to see something new. So this movie is new and it's definitely like nothing you're ever going to see uh, in the horror genre. Yeah, he says that, but he makes the remake of The Hateful Eight. So I mean, that's true. That's true. I mean, it, not to go on a rant, Tarantino, let me first say that I think Tarantino is the king of dialogue. But I also think that he's sometimes so he's very, very high ego and full of himself in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, but some people and like some people, I'm not saying they have a right. Like when you put out quality work, you get to speak a certain quality tongue. Um and I'm not going to, you said earlier, which we could have talked about, you said the family guy's only got about two good jokes. That's, that's a mm -hmm. highly false, for my personification, each episode might only have two, but the whole series has got a lot of funny stuff. Now, the guy who makes it, is he sometimes an A, Jag? Yeah. But that's like, they really go after like some people and they actually speak some truths. Like John Travolta the other day, they made a crack i had it on tv about it was 
pretty honest. It wasn't the nicest, but you know, but I, I get it. That sometimes I think uh, you know, it goes across as a jag. In terms of I no, I don't think Seth McCron's problem is a jag. I just think you know what? I think it's it kind of pulls from The Simpsons a lot, in my opinion. Like The Simpsons was one of the first film series well, yeah. I watched. Well, I, that. That. I guess and I agree with you coming from that regard. That's See, I, I wanted you now. I just didn't want you to come from the regards that some people do, and they're like, it's just uh what's the word I'm looking? It's not politically correct, so it sucks. Like there's a lot of funny stuff in there, but it is true, it has pulled a lot from the Simpsons. See, I wasn't a huge South Park fan. So to me, my humor leans a little more towards Simpsons and Family Guy. The Family Guy thing I think I like the most is the way the episode's going and his thoughts go to these different offshoots, which is mm -hmm. like the Simpsons. Um, back to Tarantino, his greatest work to me isn't like his last couple movies. They are pretty good. Um, but he does also sit in a high horse and says he's going to make this new movie that sounded incredible called The Critic and then cancel it because he didn't like something. So he is also very weird and sporadic, too. Well, not just that. I think the thing that kind of, well, one thing that kind of soured me on Tarantino was when he did uh, the Hollywood, the film of Hollywood, and he the Bruce Lee thing. That kind of soured me a little bit because... He was saying that Bruce Lee was a certain way, and then Bruce Lee's daughter came out and said he wasn't. And he was arguing with the daughter of the person he's portraying uh, when some of the stuff he was saying was not true. He starts like Jackie Chan come out and said that it wasn't true, but he was still saying this, which kind of was like, dude, how are you going to argue with that? But that's just me. And then when him and Scorsese were saying Marvel movies weren't cinema, and I think that's bullshit because just because you might not like it, like I don't like certain movies. But See, they're on the big screen different. and they make movie, they make money and they are cinema in a certain See, degree. That's a different argument. Making money and being cinema are two different arguments. Making money and saving sil making money and saving sil cinema, which is exactly what they've done, is exactly what it is. But I think what they were saying is, is when you think of movies like Jaws and you think of movies like The Godfather and Terminator 2. Do those other movies hold with those in cinema? Do they? I don't know. I would, I would say not to the degree, maybe, but you can't tell me that the character of Tony Stark, played by Robert Downey Jr., oh, no. did not affect a lot of people, especially in his death and endgame. That you to me, cinema brings out a emotional response from the person like watching it. Do you think cinema is like music in a way? Yeah. Like like in a way, like I could be arguing with people going a lot of Palooza. What is this? But the reality is, is that's what music is right now. That's like cinema. Uh, cinema for a while, I don't even know if you currently say it still is in the superhero realm because nothing really has been put out recently that's dominated in the superhero world. But there was a time period where, you know, that's this is what people enjoyed to see. And Tarantino and Martin Scorsese are only speaking because, honestly, their movies aren't as successful as they wish that they would be. Well, I check. I see too. Like that's totally a valid point. I just, I, I, I don't. Know. Kevin Feig, who did the Marvel movies, like he had a game plan for how they were all going to intertwine, and I thought that was, yeah. Whether you like, whether I liked it, I mean, I hated the, the first Captain America. I, I still don't think it's a good film, but it's in cinema. And to me, yeah. I mean, I still agree. That we can go talk about this for like hours. I just, that's just one of my. And I like Tarantino. I like his work. I like I love Scorsese. I'm just saying that I don't agree with some of their points. One last thing I'll always remember in high school, my really good friend, tell, you know, he really liked Lord of the Rings, the book. And I said, nobody's going to see that crap. And he goes, I bet you over 60 million opening weekend. And I go, 30 million, it won't top it. And I'll buy your next movie ticket. And I laughed in his face. And you know what? At that moment, when it all came home to roost to me and he slapped in my face for the next years, I realized that I don't know everything and neither does Scorsese or, you know, Tarantino. And the reality is, is cinema goers speak to what they want to go see. There's other problems in cinema, but what they said wasn't, that was stupid what they said. I agree. Yeah, that's that's why I'm like, uh, you have I agree. such I agree. big voices should speak out some of the other stuff i agree i agree that's but i digress i mean no, no, you're good you're good <laughs> all right uh
but yeah, check out it follows. I'm sorry for going on that rant with Tony. No, we that, like, that's what goes that's on. What we do here. <laughs> that was like our guest tonight. Our guest was the rant right there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's go into your next film, my man. Great taste for today. Tastes great every way. Can't get enough of the stuff. 1985 is the stuff directed by Larry Cohen, who also did Return of Sam's Lot, original gangsters. It's Alive, and he wrote a classic horror film called Maniac Cop, Uncle Sam, and Cellular, Cellular, which you don't know it's about a cell phone that kills people. This film stars Michael Moratney, Andrea Mercovici, Garrett Morris, and Paul Sorvino. The movie had a budget of $1.3 million. I couldn't find a box tone. I don't know if you did, but I couldn't find a box from this one. But uh, tell me why you picked this film. Uh, I love the blob, but when I found the stuff, um, it's like it's like watching this crazy commercial, and it actually looks it looks really awesome. Like even when looking for clips of what to pick out, um, this was the last Blu-ray I think I bought like a year ago. Um, I just and I only seen it like a little bit before that, but I just thought it was really cool. This is one of the parts that I thought was really awesome. <laughs> Uh, just <laughs> the stuff is ridiculous because it's like it's all over the place. Like the stuff is literally like it, like what the stuff is is literally what the movie is. It like literally just oozes the whole movie. Like it's little kids are touching the stuff. It's going from all these different actors. It, it's literally like a more it's like the blob except it's like they're selling this stuff and it's like very contagious you ever see the stuff yes i have and it's kind of funny because when i thought about this when i was reading our list and i was going through research for it uh one it has a lady from where's the beef from wendy's <laughs> she's in there and she says where's, where's the beef yeah, yeah. But she says where's the stuff <laughs> but this also made me think of another 90s film that was popular with kids and teenagers, which is the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers with Ivan's ooze when he gives the free ooze away and it basically like manipulates the parents to do stuff for him. That's kind of oh, yeah. like the stuff. The stuff takes over. Uh, this movie is corny, but it's hilarious. You know, I played for our lead in was the commercial they have and they have like these girls dancing around talking about the stuff. It's it's corny, but I love it. It's it's got and it, the great part is Paul Sorvino's in here. His daughter makes her first her film debut in this film. Uh, when doing research for this tone, the executive's office at the end is similar to Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. Uh, it has a stuffed polar bear in there, so I didn't notice that until I went back and looked at it. I'm like, holy shit, it does. So that's another Simpsons tie in there. That's great. Yeah, you know, it's. I did not know that. That's even yeah. no, I, That's awesome. I did not know that. It's got like everything in there in terms of like horror. It's kind of like a horror comedy to me. It's kind of corny, but good. I, I actually like this film a lot. Uh, and I recommend you check this one out because it's one of those 80 film, 80s films that never get talked about again. You know, whenever you really, really, really want to jump, I think me and you, and I know we don't want to do a remake, but maybe to start our writing movie career, we can pump up in a weekend the remake of the stuff. Um, because honestly, you know, or something like it, because it's, it's just, it's very parallel, it seems like, to, well, it could be anything in today's world. It could be the internet. It could be a lot of different things that changes people because they all, I love it, I love it, I need that stuff. And that's like, honestly, as the picture on the screen shows, there's a lot of good, um, just a lot of good, more, we are talking about effects, um, especially um, when you're thinking about a movie like this, a movie that really didn't get a lot of like there's a lot a lot of trailers um you know it, it just really wasn't uh you know a, as big of a hit as like say something like the blob but uh just really memorable though yeah and speaking of like writing our own movie script uh our my dialogue would be horrible it'd be like christopher's from the sopranos <laughs> being loyal l-o-l-y-e to his capo but 
one cool thing about this tone is according to the audio commentary on the 2000 Anchor Bay DVD, the scene in the motel where the stuff comes out of the mattress and pills and attacks the man on the wall and ceiling was shot in a room that could turn upside down. According to the stuff to move up and down the wall, it allowed it to move up and down the wall. It was exactly the same room used in 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street when Giant Depp's character is sucked into his bed and the blood is regurgitated back out into the ceiling. Hmm. Very interesting. It's pretty cool. That is very cool. Yeah, if you haven't seen this stuff, check it out. It's 80s horror at gold at its best. Yes. Let's move on to the next one, my friend. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. I'm not gonna leave you. I'm not gonna leave you. I'm not leaving you here. Okay. Two thousand two thousand five's The Descent, directed by Neil Marshall, who also did Dog Soldiers, Doomsday, and Centurion. The film stars Shauna McDonald, Natalie Mendoza, Alex Reed, the Sakia Mulder and Mayanna Burring, as well as Nora Jane Noon. The film had a budget of $3.5 million and a box office of $57 million. Another one of my picks, a film that plays again off atmosphere, has creepy-ass characters and creatures in it, and it's about caves. And for those who like to go exploring caves, this film scares the shit out of you when doing so. Uh, it has you know, one of those things where you kind of feel for the characters, like, what are they going to do next? They're in an unknown place. It's, a big, it's big off atmosphere. It has a lot of jump scares in it. Uh, and it makes you feel helpless a lot because where are you going to go? And, you know, we still explore caves. I mean, there's been stories about people getting stuck in caves and dying when they cave crawl. There's people like, I think there's a person actually that died in a cave and he's still in there because I can't get him out because he's in the cracks. You know, it's horrible stuff like that. But this film kind of bred on the unknown of cave and you have the crawlers in there that come after people and what are they? and it's just crazy that this film doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, it's an awesome horror film. I highly encourage you again to watch this one. Tony, have you seen this one? When you brought this one up, uh, as you stated earlier, when you were looking at mine, this was mine for years where I was like, I forgot. I love this movie. I forgot about this one. Um, I like movies like The Descent, Green Inferno, The Ruins. Um, I love going to odd places that you're not really expecting that you're going to go. And then you end up being neck deep in something that you never, we would never want to be in ever. So you, you feel empathy for the characters because you're like, get the hell out of there. And that's exactly what this movie is. These creatures down here. Um, yeah, very, very scary. Um, very gross too. Um, this whole scene you're seeing on the screen when she's in the red um but that's what we like horror movies for we like them for these type of things yeah and like i said this film was built on tension neil marshall who directed this film went on to say that the film is the texas chainsaw massacre the thing and deliverance were influenced in establishing tension in the film the director elaborates saying we really want to ramp up the tension slowly unlike the american horror films you see now they take it up to, to 11 in the first few minutes and simply can't keep up. We wanted to show all these terrible things in the cave, drowning, dark, and claustrophobia. Then, when it couldn't get any worse, we made it worse. Marshall also said at the 63rd Venice International Film Festival that he was inspired by Italian horror films of the past, in particular those by Dario Argento, who did Demons, and Lucio Fulci. So, again, films that was, you know, Foreign horror right, you know, films are inspiring stuff. And this film does build on tension. You know, uh, Lu Lucio Fulci is known for the zombie series. If you ever see Zombie 2 and Zombie 3, that's Lucio Fulci. So those are uh, Italian horror films. He also did the uh, New York Ripper and I think City of the Living Dead was one of his other films he did. But yeah, this film is definitely worth the watch just for the tension alone. And the claustrophobia is real in here. Like, even I was like a little claustrophobic watching because you're like, you see how the characters did beautifully acted out too. The characters really get, you know, to get you to feel their emotions and the fear they're experiencing. Yeah. I mean, very, very claustrophobic. Um, I, um, I mean, 
handful of movies I've experienced any kind of little bit of fear, honest fear. Um, this movie is definitely one of them. Um, want to watch it again because it's, uh, I watched it last year, but I didn't watch it this year. But like I stated, uh, whenever I get sad, it's the end of October. I then just tell myself I can watch horror movies all the time. It's Halloween every day, my friend. I know. As ministry says. Yes. I'm going to try to uh, get my wife to watch this one. Hopefully she's not too terrified of it. I think she might like this one. <laughs> All right, my friend. Let's get into our next one. Boy. I love that, that little clip. Boy. <laughs> 1979's Phantasm, directed by Don Corsarelli, who also did a film called Bubba Hotep. He did the Phantasm sequels 2, 3, and 4, The Beastmaster, and Kenny and Company. This film stars Michael Baldwin, Bill Thornberry, Reggie Bannister, Kathy Lester, Angus Scrim, and Kenneth B. Jones. This movie had a budget of 300 k and made $11 million at the box office, so it was a big-time financial success. This is one of Mr. Han's favorite horror films, Tone, so it cracked me up when you picked it. Tell me about Phantasm, my man. Um, I love Phantasm. Um, I love it because I found it. Like, I love it because I'm the one who was like, you know what? I've always seen this box. I've seen this title, which is an amazing title. I can't think of another cooler movie for title for a horror movie. Because you're like, what is Phantasm? And then I bought the DVD, right? It was like, I used to have, I'll never forget have like a calendar when the new DVDs would come out, like especially older movies that they were releasing on DVD. So when Phantasm came out, I still have it. It was like a cool box, so I bought it. And I hadn't actually seen it yet. And I watched it, and I was super, super happy because it was everything that I had hoped for in the horror movie. I mean, the dude who, uh, the tall man um, with the cool hair, uh, I always loved his hair in the movie. Um, the, he's Angus Grimm. Yes, just the way his uh, his manner is mannerisms are in the film um, are scary enough. Like the way this first one is, is it, it it's a build up. Um, there's a build up. It doesn't start really super scary, and I wouldn't say it's the super scariest movie I've seen. But what it is is it's got a lot of those like mental mental thrills because it deals a lot with uh death um they lost their uh parents so there is a lot of that lurking behind um the overall plot yeah and phantasm like you said what it is it's a figment of imagination and illusion or apparition according to webster's uh also the director don Cors uh, corsarelli got the idea for Phantasm, the naming of Phantasm, was because he was reading a lot of Edgar Allan Poe works, and Poe uses the word a lot in his works. But he kind of got that as his idea for the film in terms of the name. I love the flying ball. <laughs> uh, when it kills the the guy who works at the great uh, funeral home, it's just crazy. Like, I remember watching it, and like I watched it recently because I did a, like when I first did 31 Days of Horror, it is one of the films I did. And I watched it and the ball flying and kidding that guy. And then there's the blood stream of blood flowing out of the ball as it dug into a skull. It still looks cool. Even though it was a simple effect. Uh, they said it was a pretty simple effect of them doing it as well as, you know, the tall man's finger crawling around. And of course, really got that finger crawling around idea from when he punched a uh, hole in the bottom of a styrofoam cup. And he loved the visual effect of his finger coming through the hall. So he's like, oh, let's do this for the, uh, the tall man. <laughs> you know, we didn't talk about the, the dwarves in this film. The little dwarves. Oh, yeah. They walk around. They're like Jawas. Uh, the lady in velvet that uh, basically turns people, you know, for. And I think uh, the tall man, they're aliens, right? Is that like they never yeah. really explain what they, I think they're aliens, right? That's, that's, what they, that's what I took from it. <laughs> okay that's what i took from it because it's just crazy out there i i this film of course is straight up early you know early 80s late 70s kind of vibe it still holds up today angus scrim whose real name is rory uh 
it's he just used Angus Scrim because he was actually a stage actor and didn't want anybody to know he was in horror films. He thought I would ruin his reputation. But the tall man has become an iconic character. You know, he's long past. But when you talk about like the he's not gonna be on the Mount Rushmore, but when you talk about icons of horror, you know, you have the Freddies, the Jasons, the Pinheads, the Candymans, the Chuckies. And you have the Tallman has to be up there with the with Leatherface. You know, they're iconic. They have their own sequels and they have their own fan, you know, fans that are loyal to them. Uh, I always like like the way he played the character of being really cold and like menacing the way he looked at you, uh, which always freaked me out, especially when he carries the casket by himself. That's oh, yeah. scary. But yeah, it's 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 definitely a, a slow burn, but worth the watch. Um, really some cool uh, stuff when doing research behind the scenes. Um, Cascarelli, he had to, uh, his dad financed a lot of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, there were no accountants on set. So of course, you know, 300000 is the estimated budget. It could have went a little more, could have went a little less, which is crazy to think about um, when thinking about like his mom helped design even some of the special effects. And uh, one being a shotgun shell went off and his uh, blank uh, caught uh, Cascarelli's jacket on fire, which when you think about uh, behind the scenes on a, a $300,000 movie, can you imagine how awesome it would be to be a fly on the wall when they're filming this? Especially yes. when you're telling me, um, you know, Angus Grimm doesn't want to be known as a horror actor. So what's he acting like on the set? And they've <laughs> done what is there five sequels to this and honestly i've never seen a sequel have you i've seen the second one i can't really remember much about it that's what i'm saying so like that would be hilarious to watch like three four and five and see how good or bad they get yeah uh another thing about the spears they were designed by a craftsman named willard green who charged the production a little over a thousand dollars for his services uh, sadly, he died just after production completed at the end of 77, so he never saw his work on the big screen. So unfortunately, that was for him. One three hundredth of the budget went to the... Uh, the Spears. The Spears. <laughs> and the genesis of the story came to Cassarelli in a dream one night in his late teens. He dreamed of fleeing down an endless long marble corridors, pursued by a chrome spear intent on penetrating his skull with wicked needle. There was quite a futuristic spear dispenser out of which the orbs would emerge and begin chase. Uh, great, you know, that's a great shot right there you have with the yeah. tall man and the kid in front. Uh, also, I, one of my favorite scenes of the film is when he has the dream of the nightmare and the tall man is over his bed and the bodies raise up and grab him Yeah, uh, around his bed. That's a cool scene. I think that was in the trailers too. Uh, it has like a lot of good little like tidbits in there. So um, check this one out. It's like a slow burn it's very psychedelic as well yeah, yeah but it's totally worth it and it's cheesy it's like i got all the things you want like cheesiness and horror and psychedelic and the cool way it's the uh, funeral inside this place looks the looks really cool for being again uh under million dollar budget yeah they did a great job i thought they did a good job even the effects are like really done well for under a million dollar budget for, but i mean that was kind of static. Like, Chainsaw Massacre wasn't a big production, but it had cool stuff. This one I mean, kind of I, like bumped it up a little bit. You know, um, I don't want to, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to throw out this scary fact here. I mean, but when you really, really think about it, the budget for Battlefield Earth <laughs> was $44 million. And this was, well, $300,000. And, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, how good this looks and how bad that looks. I watched that film with my uncle when it came out, like on video, and everyone was saying how horrible that film was. Me and my uncle, we used to do, uh, I stayed with my aunt and uncle for a little bit when I was going to school up in, um, they live in Orland. And I was going to school when I came back from U of I at Moraine because I had to live uh, just to take some classes before I transferred to Lewis. I was staying with him, and he's like, hey, we used to do like a movie night every Friday. If I didn't have work, we do a movie night. So he's like, let's just like let's watch this movie. It's been horrible. It's got all these reviews. I want to see how bad it is. We watched it and it was boring as hell. Yeah. But it wasn't as bad as people made it out to see, in my opinion. I'd like to actually watch it now because honestly, I've never really watched it. I've just always heard. And you know, I Travolta 
I watched a movie where he Fred Durst directed it, and he had he played. It was ridiculous. It was called The Fan or something. It came out a couple of years ago. I'll watch him in anything. So I I could bet that it's not as bad as it is. I mean, if you we if you know you, I almost spoke for myself. Had to sit through that new Crow. I mean, Battlefield Earth definitely. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Travolta's probably a worst movie is. You know, when when he was big, it's probably uh, the Gotti film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I really wanted it to be good, and it wasn't yeah, really bad. Yeah. yeah, I wanted it to be good, too. It just was that. Yeah, but definitely check out Phantasm. It has a lower budget than Battlefield Earth, and it's better than Battlefield Earth. <laughs> yes. yes, there you go. Yeah, good pick, Tom. Thanks. Let's go on to our next one, my friend. Even a big bitch cockroach like you should know. Never, never fuck with the king. Going back to Casarelli, we got a 2002 film called Bubba Hotep, directed by Don Casarelli, starring the great Bruce Campbell with Ozzy Davis, Bob Ivey, and Ella Joyce. The film had a budget of 1.4 million, actually a box office of 1.4 million, and a budget of 1 million, and 57k in home media sales. Another film I picked, Tony, so like I wanted to go outside the realm, the realm of all these, uh, you no know, popular films, and I love the fact we picked two uh, Corsarelli films back to back. This film is totally out there. It's about, it, first of all, it has a crazy story. For one, it basically plays off the rumor that Elvis never really died. Bruce Campbell plays Elvis, and he gets tired of being in the limelight and wants to basically start his life as kind of a more quieter, so he switches with an impersonator. Uh, he, so when the impersonator died on the toilet, that was a, that was the impersonator, not the real Elvis. And unfortunately for him, he had all his birth certificates and stuff proving he was a real Elvis in his trailer that blew up from a from a propane tank when he was grilling. And it shows him in basically an old folks home. People think he's crazy. The character of Ozzy Davis thinks he's JFK, even though he's an African American. They talk about this. Uh, Bruce Campbell tells him he's, he's you know Jack, you know Bruce, you know JFK was a white man. And he's like, I know this is what he did to me to hide the conspiracy. I love the fact that Ozzy Davis plays the character. That's you don't know if he's serious or he's just crazy. That this is all going around while we have a mummy coming back from the dead. Who takes people's souls by sucking out of their ass? <laughs> he's going in, he's going through his old folks' home, terrorizing. And the comedic, you know, scene between Ozzy Davis and Bruce Campbell, who does, you know, you don't make me use my stuff on you, baby, while he's in his walker, the karate, and they fight this mummy is just crazy. It's hilarious. I love this film. It's a film that is a cult classic. You know, there's been comic books that are made of this. You know, Bubba Hotep has fought. Um, you know, Freddy Krueger, I believe in one. Jason Voorhees in one. There's a film. There's a comic book where Bubba meets Ash. So you have two Bruce Campbell characters meet. Uh, it's iconic, and it's kind of got more of a mainstream, you know, cult vibe to it. Recently, I know Paul Giamatti had came out and said he wanted to do a sequel, but he wanted Bruce Campbell to come back. Uh, Bruce Campbell was interested, and it's never really kind of got made to the point where my fans wanted. Uh, but I would love to see a sequel, especially since Ruth Camp- Campbell's older and he's not doing the whole physical stuff anymore with the Evil Dead. It'd be kind of cool if he came back as Bubba uh, for Elvis, you know, Bubba Hotep Part 2. But, um, Tone, tell me about this film, man. Um, I can remember exactly. I was just thinking about a, a, a time in my life, 2004, 2005. I'm single and my buddy calls me up and says, I got this movie we're going to watch. And I'm like, what's it called? He's like, it's called Bubba Hotep. And I'll never forget it. I go, okay. And he call, and he's heading over. And then I call my other friend. And I go, you won't believe Derek just called me and said, uh, he's bringing over a movie called Bubba Hotep. I go, I don't know what I'm going to be watching here. And we sat down. And honestly, as you stated, it's a good time. It's a fun time. Bruce Campbell has never let me down in any movie. I don't, I don't really uh, believe. So like him, Elvis. I love Ozzy Davis too, you know, playing JFK. It's just the whole idea of the mummy coming around is is ridiculous. Um, I also want to state, 
I swear, I swear on everything, every movie I've ever watched, I did not realize again that we picked two Don Coscarelli movies back to back when I sent you my list. I swear, Phantasm, until we were actually doing it here, I'm like, that's right. Here we are lining up again. So that's just by coincidence, folks, these two Don Coscarelli movies. Um, but um, just the funness of this movie, I think, is what I enjoy the most. And that's what I love about just the funness, the the absurdness of the story. You know, uh, supposedly, like, there was a prequel titled Bubba Nosferatu, The Curse of the She Vampires has been in works for years. That was That's never come out. Uh, before Bruce Campbell accepted the role of Elvis, he had one question for Don Casarelli. He said, "Are you going to have to show penis?" <laughs> which, which is so random. But Bruce Campbell is known for being, uh, you know, out there with just random stuff. Another crazy thing I noticed too, when I did research for this tone, because I've seen this film like a lot, is no Elvis music is played during this whole <laughs> film. And I, I just realized, like, that's right. Like, I don't ever remember hearing an Elvis song, and the reason was because. Of the licensing, they didn't have sure. the money for licensing, but it's crazy that you have Elvis in here and there's no Elvis music played. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is uh, always that problem with licensing. Licensing recently, they've they did a Jimi Hendrix biography with uh, um, Andre 3000, but they could get none of the licensing from the Hendrix Foundation, so it's just like him playing the guitar like not any hendrix song but like just like because you can't do it it's like monster squad so like uh but i think for this one it works because it's like it adds to the is he crazy is he elvis is he not because if elvis music was playing all the time it may make you believe more he actually was elvis where in here he's just telling a story like well ozzy davis maybe he's jfk yeah one of the most iconic shots of this film was when they're when they're about to face the mummy whose name Bubba holds up. And they're about to face him and they they roll up like he's in his walker and Ozzy Davis rolls up in his electric wheelchair. That always just cracks me up how they just come up. But yeah, definitely check this one out. It's a it's comedic. It's not really scary, but it has a lot of good one liners in it. Uh Bruce Campbell is the man and Ozzy Davis is the man. Check it out. It's worth your time. Believe me, you'll like this one if you haven't seen it. But awesome that we picked two Corsarelli films. Like back yeah, to back. very awesome. And let's get into our final one, my friend. Hey, hey, you know that movie about the guy that's got like these superpowers and shit because of his hair? Then this bitch cuts his hair off and he gets weak. He gets like an ordinary guy. You know that movie? I'm better looking than the guy in that movie. Don't you think? Creep Show 2, released in 1987, directed by Michael Gornick, who did Stephen King's Golden Tales, along with other TV shows, one off episodes, starring George Kennedy, Lois Childs, Dominic John, Tom Savini as the Creeper, Don Harvey, Dan Kamen, Dorothy Lamour, and Hoyt McCallany, who is Sam Whitemoon, who we just heard in the uh, opening. The film had a box office of $14 million, a budget of three and a half. A tone, Sam White Moon, me and my brother still quote Sam White Moon just for his like talk about his hair. That's why, that's even though Holt's not a uh, native and we also like indigenous people playing those characters, like he gets a pass because they, for most of the film, that story, they use indigenous characters, but he is just hilarious in that film. I, I, that story, I'm sorry. Uh, tell me why you picked this one, my man. This hair is going to get me paid and laid. <laughs> we used to say that all the time. I mean, his character is am amazing. That whole scene where he goes into that camera booth and he's like, look, look at that hair. And the way he's like talking to the camera. And honestly, when I found out that that was him in Mindhunter, I, I literally, I'll never forget that Katie looked at me like I was insane. Because I was like, that's him. Creep show too. That, but honestly let's get started um all three episodes i love them all three um and i love them all for different ways george kennedy's great in the first episode along with holt but it, it's a classic cheesy scary movie i mean i've seen those those awesome cool uh 
you know, statues in front of stores before or in movies. What if one of them came to life and actually took apart these people who actually did harm to the the people who they were trying to harm? And I think that's what was cool about that first story. Yeah, is the statue a little cheesy as it moves? A little bit, but I think that's part of what the creep show fun is. It doesn't have to be 100% um, logical. Um, story two, the raft. Uh, this one probably is my favorite of all the stories because I like a lot of the quotes in these stories. Uh, in story two, um, <laughs> there's there's a scene where uh, I mean, it, it, every horror movie which you could talk about a lot and do a whole episode on. Somebody's always smoking, uh, smoking weed in, in every horror movie where weed is involved. In episode two, when they're on the raft, he's like trying to tell the one idiot buddy, the one who's like the jerk jock. He's like, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think this is not good. This thing's been following us. And he's like, mucho ecological, Pablo, mucho ecological. It's just like the stupidest thing to say. Um, just dumb um but excellent uh it does look like a garbage bag floating on the lake but it is very cool just the way i just don't understand how he wasn't able to outswim it that has always been a problem of mine and then of course i mean this one is you know everyone's favorite how you doing lady thanks thanks for the ride uh <laughs> Probably the very first in all of this creep show, Tales from the Crypt, the first thing that I remember seeing, and it like stuck with me at probably a too young of an age, because he just keeps coming back. And uh, also a great Halloween costume, Dover, you get the sign and you put the hat on. I've, I've seen that before, but I love this movie, man. I love it a lot. It's crazy. Like, you know... Creep Show, the original, is such a classic. And again, this one doesn't get talked about enough because it's the sequel. But I mean, it's a different type of sequel. It's, of course, it's Creep Show has the anthology film, but I think it's just as good. Uh, I like the original better personally, yeah. Oh, yeah. but this one is, you know, this one still holds up. It has three decent stories. Uh, I like the hitchhiker at the end. Uh, the Wrath always cracked me up because it does look like a garbage bag. Uh, also, it has some random, like, when everybody's dying from this thing, the, when the girl and the guy are on the raft, he decides he wants to get laid. <laughs> like, that makes no fucking sense to me, that part. Because I'm like, oh, yeah, like, that's the first thing I'm thinking about. But I guess, you know, the guy was horny and wanted to get laid. He lost his girlfriend, too. Like, yeah. like <laughs> that quickly? He's like, oh, I'd rather just get laid if I'm going to die. That wouldn't be the least thing I'd be thinking about. I mean, I, I could be on there with Nicole, I mean, Nicole, uh, what's her name from, uh, Margot Robbie from yeah. uh, Wolf of Wall Street, and I'm like, still like, I gotta get out of here, man. <laughs> like, there's a there's a bag floating. It's gonna kill us. <laughs> yeah, but the ending to that story is awesome. Yeah, oh, yeah. I love the ending to that. Uh, you know, and then the, Chief... uh, the bag or the way the sign was blocked by the uh, the weeds. Like, I like the way that was cool. The way when the camera pans out, all of it. Like, yeah. The way yeah. it, the way it ends with him, it's like, yeah. oh, I beat you, and then it takes yeah. him, and then the I way it, beat you. It, it Run just more. I've watched that so many times. Go further up the beach. <laughs> yeah, what the hell are you doing? Uh, the crazy thing is, when doing research for this tone, Arnold Schwarzenegger was rumored to have been considered for the role of Old Chief Woodenhead, <laughs> uh, who was the uh, killer in the first story. And like you said, these statues are all over. Most famously on 63rd and Pulaski, the ICU guy. Uh, it was featured in Wayne's World. If you ever seen Wayne's World, even though they're coming from uh, Aurora, that's nowhere near Aurora, but you see the tall indigenous person with the glasses of the ICU guy. Uh, imagine if that guy came to life and started busting up shit. Like, <laughs> you know, this film has all like little cool little things in there. I thought the uh, the stories were original and they were kind of cool in terms of uh, you know they had different types of turns and twists in them, uh, and. You know, Sam White White um, Moon gets his fucking head cut, hair cut off because he's obsessed with it. Uh, but definitely a great film to end our top ten with. Film. 
and, and just real quick too, at the end, the uh, last episode, that stupid, that the stupid lady. Okay, just that lady. She's just so stupid. She she deserved what she got from that guy. Well, not because she hit him and then she tried to run, but she's first cheating on her husband at the beginning. And then she's like driving home and she's like pretending like she's going to get caught for cheating. It's just ridiculous greatness, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yes. yes, Definitely. Yes, stories are worth it. Uh, have you seen creep show three? Uh, unfortunately, no, I have not because I've just read not good things. I haven't seen it. I haven't watched any of the TV series either. Uh, I did watch some of the TV series. Uh, was pretty good from what I from the three or four or five I watched in the first season. Um, but again, you know they bury some of this stuff on like you know it's hard to access sometimes. I think it was like on AMC Plus or something. Yeah, I haven't seen any of it. I know uh, some episodes got kind of cut because of certain things that were going on uh the marilyn manson one was one of them uh i haven't watched it i know i think my brother saw he said he saw creep show three and it wasn't that good i don't know if there is there a creep show four uh well this was the real thing creep show i don't know if you've ever heard this but creep show three was originally supposed to be tales from the dark side the movie Mm -hmm. but uh but uh something got messed up along the way with licensing like back to licensing again and they switched it to tales from the dark side the movie but uh this is these creep show movies this is one that if you ask me one that i really think that they should do again i think this would be perfect yeah and you could come up with original stories you don't have to go with the year you just come with new uh have like jordan peele will be on there have john carpenter is you know still here pick his brain for one yeah uh have the even if you want to have oh god i even though i don't like him uh green from the halloween series <laughs> if you want to have him do it. david gordon green but uh have those guys come out and try to do something before it's yeah. too late that'd be kind of cool yeah. stephen king's still here do something with him again you know he may yeah. give you come back jordy is <laughs> in the original the uh, the meteor meteor shit <laughs> but yeah i i'll i'll be down for that yeah, but I'll definitely agree with you. Creepshow one is like more like Creepshow one's like classic. Creepshow two's really, really good, cheesy classic. It's so like it's like there's a little bit of a difference. Um part one, besides the the uh Stephen King episode, it's all pretty serious, I think, you know. But yeah. it's yeah. that great. The though. Stephen King and the crate are my two favorite stories from the first one. Oh. Well, uh, the crate is probably one of the greatest short stories in horror history. Yeah, Savini calls the the monster fluffy. <laughs> He's awesome. Yeah, uh, but those are our films. Let us know if we missed any films that you might have not had and heard of, or want us to let um, know about. You know, Halloween is our favorite month. Both me and Tone, uh, we showed it with the content we put out. Uh, so content coming out is kind of be a little you know we're gonna take a, a little slow down a little break a little bit we'll still be doing the show weekly uh i'll release a video at least every two weeks if i can um but doing a video every day was kind of <laughs> it was fun but it was a lot of work and i know tone i know you liked writing the blogs every day but still it's still a lot of work to do it every day not come out is. it is one thing i wanted to give another shout out with your videos is one of your picks uh what lies beneath when I saw that you picked What Lies Beneath, you, uh, you made me smile on multiple levels because uh, me and Katie always do the quote, uh, she's starting to suspect something, <laughs> your wife. But not only that, um, I'll never forget me and my friend. We, all, Me and my buddy almost got thrown out of the movie theater because James Remar, um, when he the camera pans to him and he's staring in the house and he's just looking at them, I've never laughed so hard in such an unintentional way because James Remar rules so much, but him playing that role is so awesome. Um, just a really cool pick, Yump. And honestly, all of your picks that you did were awesome, but uh, really cool to see you sometimes. And that's what we talked about here in some of these picks tonight. You know, we want to, you know, we want to get underneath your skin, just like the pick you said. You know, we want to, we want you to pick some of these movies. You know, hear some of these movies that we pick that are really kind of you might not hear every day. 
Yeah, and the James Remar when uh, she suspects him of killing his wife, and then he sees her at a party with his wife, and he goes and grabs her to be an asshole. That, cra- that always cracked me up. Uh, but yeah, I really appreciate it, man. I loved everything you did with the 31 blogs. I read them every day, and I try to promote them as much. If you guys have not read Tony's blogs, go to statisticalpainstudios.com and check them out. You can also find the 31 Days of Horror there as well if you want to go from there and watch them there, or you can watch them on the YouTube. There's a playlist that we have for that there. Uh, Tone, uh, before we go into coming soon and the Sugar Baggies soundtrack pick of the week, uh, just doing a little housekeeping here. Uh, the show for uh, the Getting Drafting here will be doing horror movie villains. Uh, we had to reschedule this week. It will be myself and Keelan, along with Magnus Vincent mm-hmm. Stan, a.k.a. Brian. We'll be doing that, I believe. It'll be happening next week, next Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, also, the hook up on music, Tone. What's coming up on that? Uh, we got an episode planned next Friday. Um, the Cure just came out with a brand new album today. If you have not heard it, I've listened to the first six tracks. Sounds like classic Cure, um, which is hilarious because Robert Smith just said today it's really tough for him to write sad songs anymore in his old age, which is kind of funny um, to hear him say that because, um, but honestly, everything I've heard so far sounds really good. So we're going to dig into that. Um, Dig into some other stuff too. Uh, throwing around some temper trap. Haven't listened to that in a while. Uh, see what else we got coming up and uh, check us out. Cool. Yeah. Check. So check out Tony and the hookup on music. Usually he does a show before us, depending on uh, what's going on at work. Uh, we do work real jobs. So, but uh, this is kind of like our outlet, creative outlet. But yeah, check us out on the statisticpenguinstudios.com and be sure to check out everything here on the youtube page as well if you're list if you're listening via audio check us out on youtube there's stuff there you know i have aloha's collectors corner pete does a great job with his stuff uh if you like college football luke's doing a great job with the grateful ducks even though his ally his, my ally and i got their ass beat by oregon which i'm not happy about but i digress and say he does a great job uh and look out for you know more blogs and stuff coming out soon uh, we're going to keep, try, keep trying to pump out content. Maybe not as much as, not as frequent as we did, but we will still have some stuff. And we got stuff in the works coming up as well. But uh, now that we got housekeeping out of the way, Tom, let's get into uh, what's coming soon, my friend. If I can find a damn video. Oh, here we go. Let's get ready to rumble. Coming soon. Proximamente. Coming soon. Coming soon. So what we got coming soon, Tone? Next week, uh, we are digging into a movie based on a video game, which is kind of cool. We are going to be digging into the most recent re- uh, rendition of the Mortal Kombat series, which was cool when you reached out to me, uh, because what I thought about was I really enjoyed this time period. I didn't enjoy uh, the time period of not being able to go to the movie theater. What I enjoyed was the whole year where HBO Max released one movie every month on HBO Max. And one of them that they released was Mortal Kombat. And we're going to be going through this one because... Go ahead. Well, they just released a screenshot of the new sequel that's coming out. I believe they wrapped up filming and they're showing Shou Kahn. Uh, as a character they also released not too long ago Quan chi which if you're fans of the video game was another character that have not made their way he hasn't made his way into a feature film yet uh which fans are really excited about uh i don't want to spoil it i really enjoyed though the remake well the reboot um there were certain things i didn't like about it, which we'll get into in our talk but i think it's kind of cool that this is coming back and yeah, during this time zone, they had, you know, Mortal Kombat came out. They had other films that were released to stream because the movie theaters were kind of dead due to COVID. Um, I don't know if they're going to release this one again, the new one that comes out on stream, but I think it'll be some money. Theater. it deserves to be in the theater, kind of like, uh, what's that? The one with the Predator remake, the last one, um, the Predator, what was it uh, called? I know what you're talking about. Um, oh, it was Prey. Prey, Prey. That deserved to be at the theater. I mean, Mortal Kombat did such a good job and was such a good movie that if it wasn't the COVID times, it would have been in the theater. So hopefully this one's in the theater. Yeah, and the next one actually will release in 2025 in October. 
I know that uh, Johnny Cage will be making an experience, uh, appearance in this one. Also, uh, follow the co- uh, creator, Todd Gardner, who does the producer. If you follow him on Twitter, he actually posts a lot of stuff, like little uh, Easter eggs from the new film, which is kind of cool. But I'm looking forward to it. Um, and we'll talk about this one next week. Something new for November, and then might go back to the old format. Might even do another deep dive. Well, you never know. You got to check out and see. Let's see. Can't wait. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe one day we'll do a uh, breakdown on the great movie with Raul Julia and John Claude Van Damme. In oh Street yes, Park. yes, the one where <laughs> the one where I'll never forget where my 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 mom took me to a uh, a one o'clock showing at River Oaks, and she did not look happy when we were done. Like she wasted her time, and I was like, "But it's Street Fighter." Now I realize she did waste her time. You know, even though I'm not a huge fan of the Nostalgia Critic, he did a film called uh, with his other creators called Kick Assia, and there's a part where he's dressed like. Raul Julia's character of Bison, <laughs> and he's talking about he's going against his character in Doctor Insano. It's it's a stupid concept, but he's like, how do you? He's telling Doctor Insano is asking, how do you? How are you electric? And he goes into the same speech that Raul Julia does with it powers the uh, speed trains from Tokyo, and he's like, it also powers me, and he does that like face. Well, he does it in there and like it cuts back and forth and looks like he's floating, but and the guy calls him out, he's like, You're on your tippy toes. And he just but just like how iconic the performance of Julia has become because oh, he is the God. definitely the best part of the whole movie. Oh yeah. Uh, and also like Yeah, underrated actor, great stage actor, and people hated the movie, but they praised him, which is kind of yeah. crazy. Like critics, I'm saying Ebert praised him for his acting in the film. Uh but it's always great that uh, John Claude Van Damme plays a character who's American and has a French accent. <laughs> but I don't know. Again, we're going off another tangent, but that's why we, we do this show. Yes. But yeah, be sure to check us out next week for the Mortal Kombat breakdown. Uh, Tone, let's not keep him waiting and let's get into your big segment of the Sugar Baggies soundtrack pick of the week my friend if i can find your here you go here we go the sugar baggy soundtrack pick of the week All right, tonight we've got the Mallrat soundtrack, released October 17th of 1995. A really interesting mix of, there's punk, there's indie, there's pop punk. Um, Produced by Kevin Smith, was the executive producer on the soundtrack. Um, Mixed with a lot of different things, from Bush doing a song called Bubbles. Um, You got Mallrats, uh, the song done by the band Wax. Who, if you don't remember Wax, a really awesome band that was around in the 90s. Um, Belly, Squirt Gun, Sublime doing the classic Smoke Two Joints. Um, we also had uh, Silver Chair on the album doing Stoned. What's really cool is that the album has 25 tracks on it. Um, some of them are interludes, which is Jason Muse goofing around and Jason and Jeremy London. But uh, overall, though, a lot of good stuff. Elastica, Belly. Um, if you don't remember Girls Against Boys, that's another band that was really awesome um, from their original run up until 2009. But a great soundtrack from Kevin Smith. Eventually here, I'm going to have to go through every Kevin Smith soundtrack because they generally all have really good music on it. Um, but uh, the track that I let off with there, Suzanne um, by Weezer. Um one of my favorites, um, a quick track um, from the sessions of Pinkerton, um, their second album. But uh, overall, just a really great album um, put together awesomely. A great follow-up soundtrack to the Clerk soundtrack. Um, really good stuff. You ever listen to this one yet? Yeah, I have. It's a awesome uh, 
soundtrack. It's got Bush on there too. I think Bubbles is on there. That's a good. Yeah. Track. Uh, seventeen. I think is on there too. Sponge. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to off the top of my head. Uh, MSS would love this because he's a huge Kevin Smith fan. Nice. Uh, but definitely uh, another film that like cannot be made today. But I love it just for the so wackiness and out there and the uh, skewer verse that is uh Kevin Smith's world. Yes. I uh, always love the uh, son of Joel <laughs> deal <laughs> before Zod. Yes. New cheese. But yeah, definitely a, a good pick tone, a good album, totally 90s, good bands in there. Uh, and it kind of like let off the um, skewerverse. Like it kind of made that a, a big thing. Yeah. And what's crazy is, is uh, it only came out like uh, it was in October 17th. So next year, celebrating 30 years, mall rats already. Can you believe it? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, crazy stuff. I, I, there was supposed to be a sequel, but I don't think it's ever going to come out, especially nope. with Shan Dorothy passing away. Uh, but um, I always, two things that always stick out about mall rats is the chocolate covered pretzel, my mind, and Jaws, <laughs> the ride. <Yeah. laughs> that was. Yeah. Whenever I think of Mall Rats, I think of those two things. Uh, but definitely, definitely uh, worth the watch, and I love what to listen, man. Great, great pick. Thank you, thank you very much. So that is our episode for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope we uh, met your standards on top of horror movies that we've watched and talked about for the month of October. Again, we'll be going deep diving into Mortal Kombat. Uh, we got some other stuff planned for the month of November. Uh, be sure to check us out on statisticpenguinstudios.com for our blogs and stuff that we mentioned earlier. And just want to say thank you for everyone that watched, listened, uh, comments, tweets at us for any conversation, whether it's with the At The Pod Show Twitter account or our personal accounts, Talk Movies. We're always open to talk movies. Tony's always open to talk music. Uh, we're mostly, you know, anything you want to talk in terms of entertainment, we're going to talk to you guys. Thank you so much. Without you guys, we wouldn't be doing this because people actually listen to what we're doing. Uh, and we hope we are um, supplying the entertainment for everyone. Um, thanks again. And Tone, any closing words, my friend? Uh, everyone out there, um, very excited to continue this journey with you. Um, tonight was our 35th episode um, of the season. Yeah? We only got a couple more. and We've beaten the last three episodes uh, for the past uh, couple seasons. So it's going to be good stuff. Yeah, this is actually 36, episode 36. Oh, jump. I didn't want to correct you, but if you go to our um, playlist and count them, there are only 35 there. We, you were wrong for a couple of episodes, and I never corrected you. Oh, my you. God. Skip what? open. But I did not want to correct you, but I think tonight it was time. We only have. I do with, But you know what, Yump? I wanted to tell you, if you ever want to do like a secret one, and we could do like a secret episode that we never really did, but like count it. We could do that too. Son of a bitch. I have a, <laughs> I'm looking at my lip because I have a, uh, you know, peek behind the curtain here, as Lone okay. likes to say. I have a hard drive for all our stuff we do for pods and all that stuff. And I'm okay. looking at and I did skip a number. You know what? No, <laughs> you did it like seven episodes and I'm like, you know what? I don't know what to do. And you know what? For seven episodes, I actually in my notebook skipped a number two. And then I'm like, you know what? We got to be honest, you know? We got we we can't because just think of it, yeah. Four more, and we've beaten the last three, three years. Seasons. Yeah, yeah. So I see. Got, it. I skipped. Um, you know, it's probably because it was my son's birthday. The July episode, the nineteenth, was the twenty first. Yeah, and the 29th. and then after the twenty ninth, I said episode twenty four in the list here. Son of a gun. <laughs> but okay, so we're at episode 35. But yeah, we're gonna keep trucking. We're gonna hit that, uh, try to hit that 100 mark within the next half year coming up and then beyond. Uh, oh, but yeah. again, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we big appreciate stuff coming, big stuff coming up. Yep, take it easy, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the At the Show podcast, a Sadistic Penguin Studios production. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do? Maybe we could build a fire, sing a couple of songs, huh? Why don't we try that?